Okay, Reem, what do we have here? This is a project you've been working on. So basically in 2010, I had come back to New York because my partner was uh, diagnosed with cancer and I had closed the building of People's Media Center because it was falling apart and I was regrouping. Mm. Where's People's Media Center at? Where was that at? It used, at, it used to be in Washington, D.C., in Petworth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had come back, and then after 12 years of absence, I went to Syria to meet up with my parents for their 50th anniversary after my partner passed away. I needed some time. And a lot of the nieces and nephews were like, why do you do all these programs only in the U.S.? We can really use that in Syria. My friends were like, we can use that in Lebanon. And I was thinking, yeah, it might make sense. People's Media Center bylaws allows you to open similar uh, training and research centers and community centers in all sorts of different places. Let me look into it. 2011... I went back and the revolution had started. So things changed and I wanted to be relevant to my community. So a lot of lessons of forming the DC Radio Co-op, People's Media Center, working with uh, Haitians and other countries that had issues and where the whole international community flocked to help supposedly recover from the disaster uh, uh, had warned me that foreign intervention even of non-profit and of um, organizations takes 75 to 80 percent of uh, whatever comes as donations and what you really need is to up power people at the base in solidarity. They explained to me that was important is, for instance, if there's an earthquake in Haiti, don't be, and they talk about lacking water, don't be rushing to bring them a whole bunch of Evian bottles. What you really need is to identify community leaders and not just um, anybody and ask them how do they want to solve it, work with them on that, and chances are they'll tell you we need pots and um, um, to be able to boil the water because they have water, they just need to sterilize it. Mm -hmm. So I went to Syria to see um, wh where my people's mind was. Mm -hmm. Now, and so you're, you're originally from Syria? Which your, 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 your lineage is what? I was born in Syria, in Aleppo, which is a home in most north of the Arab world. And we moved to Lebanon when I was around eight, nine. Oh, so you went from Syria to Lebanon. And I grew up in Lebanon till oh. I'm 21, and I came to the U.S. Lebanon, though also declared an Arab country, has a totally different culture than Syria. Lebanon is a mercantile society. Syria is mostly an agrarian society for the majority. Syria is uh, uh, matrilinear. Lebanon is patrilinear. So there's a lot of differences, um, and I thought that with all the refugees flocking to Lebanon, they're going to need to be a lot of mediation between the new communities and also supporting the local capabilities, both Lebanese, Syrian, and Palestinian, Syrian, and Palestinian, Lebanese, in handling the issue. So... Um, I'm going to talk about how we formed Farid Beirut the, uh, and why we created In Solidarity We Can, which is a campaign to bring attention to the needs, to the efforts, and um, it's an open invitation to be part of that network. Okay, let's start. And of course, we have to start the logical thing. What does Farid Beirut mean? It means Beirut team. and it's, So Farid uh, means team? Yes. F A R I K means team in in uh, in Arabic or in, in Arabic. Arabic. And we will see the development of Farid Beirut. Uh, so the in the very beginning we see I didn't form it by myself. When I identified that there's a lot of need for psychosocial support, a lot of the younger Syrians I'm 60 now. A lot of the younger Syrians that I met were like Rim. We need to um, create an organization that supports um, psychosocial support. And I realize that what's really needed is also to look into what is needed for the Syrians. So experts were needed. With my cousin, Abdelaziz Halaj, and his wife, Cindy Halaj, we used to do every Saturday open house to cook um, uh, home cooking for a lot of the 
professional intellect and other young Syrians that had flocked Lebanon and are living in all sorts of ways to be grounded, to rebuild their social capital. And from that came the concept of starting to network, starting to talk with them. I had asked the community that there's no way that I, with an engineering background, computer science and media, I would head uh, a team for psychosocial support. And I haven't been in Syria in so long. So they brought to me a a 38-year-old man, Mutwali Abu Nasser, who's a Palestinian Syrian from Al Yarmouk, who actually has a master's in psychology and for 25 years had been teaching philosophy, but also involved in a lot of programs, projects of, with the Palestinian well, he, refugees. Is that him right there? On, on yes. Right? Now, well, he's, was, was he teaching in Syria or Lebanon? Where was he? He was teaching? Syrian in Syria. He's from Al Yarmouk camp in Damascus. So his degree and all his all his uh, academic work, work is in Syria. Okay. And his education is in Arabic, though a lot of it translated from all over the world. I was fascinated by the intellect of the Syrians that I met, especially the Palestinian Syrians. I also realized that. Oh, I'm sorry, we, sorry, I didn't mean. To really, whoa, you just said that we say Syrians. Okay, so now you say Palestinian Syrians, but but pa- is Palestine. We mentioned Lebanon, Syria, but isn't Palestine someplace else? How, what's this Palestinian Syria thing? <laughs> with the Israeli invasion, actually with the Zionist occupation of Palestine, a lot of Palestinian flocked out with the concept that they'll be back. And they've been out for some 70 years. And oh, uh, there's like, like, a whole like, community yeah. hmm. that is for the third generation being born, actually the fourth generation now being born yeah, so. in refugee camps. So yeah, like uh, the Syria late, hosts... Like the late, late uh, Edward Said, like, like that kind of people that uh, intellect someplace else, you know. Yes, Um, but uh, Edur Said is uh, the way better to do kind of refugee. Um, There is uh, less, um, it's a bit like Native American reservations, except Mm -hmm. the reservations are in Syria, in Lebanon, and a lot of other countries, Mm -hmm. but mostly Libya, uh, sorry, Syria and Lebanon. Uh, Metwali comes from Al Yarmouk, which is the largest a Palestinian um, camp in Syria, and he was born in Syria, so he's Palestinian Syrian. I felt that we also needed a Palestinian, uh, sorry, a Syrian mother. So um, we met Dia, who was part of Rising into the Light. Okay, so this is this woman here? Yes, okay. and she is much more traditional than both Metwali and I, um, uh, more uh, was brought up secular. And she's trained in speech um, speech therapy and recovery. So you see them there. Metwali was training actually some of the young people. And in the photo, uh, Dia was uh, doing a workshop with the little girls. But we're going to come back to how we developed the programs. We focused on empowering women and girls because Syria being a matrilinear society, it was very important that we hold it from who runs it, even though it masquerades to be patriarchal since the Turkish occupation and also interfacing with a lot of patriarchal Arab countries. When you say masquerade, did they do it intentionally because they knew that the uh, the Turks or the, or the Turkish uh, people are more uh, uh, patriarchal? I mean, how did that... It just came about okay. where um, it made more sense so. to protect the women that used to be mm-hmm. picked up and build the uh, Turkish harems. Mm. And, uh, but it stayed um, in the inside of the house. We have a very big joke in Syria mm. that's relevant to this point, which is that you don't have as much fights, supposedly, as in other cultures. And someone from another culture asks them, well, how do you do it? And the woman says, the men take all the important decisions in the family, and I take all the simple ones. He decides if we should have a ship going to the moon as human race and in, we should um, uh, you know discover the uh, outside earth mm-hmm. they choose if we should do a ceasefire in a country we decide where the family should live whether the kids should be educated or get to work and who marries whom mm-hmm. so that's how they so there is it. no fight because the men are not fighting inside and the women are not fighting the outside forces okay yeah 
and basically men handle just talk mm -hmm. and women take care of all the practical decisions <laughs> 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 All right, okay, I get a so, better interpretation. All right. yeah. <laughs> so here Mutwali was running a psycho uh, a drama and Dia was running a women's circle. Uh, in solidarity, we can support Farid Beirut. The slide says training field workers. And here we see a photo of um, a, one of the members of Farid Beirut documenting, and that's Leah who came from uh, actually New York. Oh, um, this person here is documenting? Right. Okay, sure. It was very important, you know, to always document the work done, both as a uh, documentation of the work of Farid Beirut, but also of the state of um, affairs in Lebanon for Syrian refugees. Mm -hmm. So, and here we see another photo of me training in communication, Warid and other um, people that were be just before a campaign to mm -hmm. help in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Since 2013, me on my side and Matwali by his side, before we even met, we assessed the refugees and host needs and capabilities. We organized and developed a curriculum as regional experts in trauma recovery, psychosocial and pedagogic support, and we started community support and capacity building, providing research, training, and executive support to organizations providing services to refugees from uh, very Syria. Very nice reading, but can you sort of break that down in, in common English for us? It's going to come about as we develop the presentation. So basically, we, um, we were very aware that we cannot decide what people need. We need to go on the ground and see them. So you will see us in photos um, how we went about actually assessing what the community needs. We uh, looked at the internet about what's really going on all over Syria. And though I had been there uh, during the beginning of the revolution and what became the war and Metwali too, we hadn't documented that. Uh, uh, so we took that from the media. There was a lot of explosions, destroyed homes, destroyed community, and a lot of people with special needs. Um, we also watched flocks of Syrians coming, either walking through the borders in Lebanon or even being trucked in. And they came onto Lebanon's resident who still haven't overcome their trauma um, of the war. And I actually, as an oral historian, had been invited to a few of the Lebanese circles to see how we can document a multi-linear narrative of the history of Lebanon. And through this and other involvement with Lebanese organizations, I realized that the Israeli cluster bombs are still in Lebanon. History and memory of Lebanese is still totally shattered by the invasion and their own civil war and um, they're trying to grapple with the leftover of it. Mm -hmm. There is an issue of lack of food and um, all these amount of refugees needing food. So here you see them gathered in front of one of the distribution centers of food in South Lebanon. Um, we went and took photos as we moved about, and you see that in various places in Lebanon, whether in Hamra, one of the most prominent commercial uh, sectors in Beirut, Hart Ne'ameh, which was a town, which is a town between Beirut and Saida, you see how traumatized they are, these little kids, when they're looking at the camera. And some of them already have special Is this a urinal? What is this, what is this thing? This here? is... Uh, Oh, this is actually a, um, um, a collect, yeah, a, a collective bathroom. Mm -hmm. um, this photo is taken from them being in a school um, that was converted into dwelling, where every mm -hmm. classroom became a family house, a uh, studio, if you would. Mm -hmm. And um, on the left, you see her begging. A lot of the ch uh, families will send their little kids to beg as the parents are looking for work. You see them also sitting in makeshift tents and uh, shacks. And this is along the Litania River. Lots of garbage on the grounds. These are the professional people. And um, either they're trying to use their capabilities to help the community 
Um, you see the elders in their wheelchairs. Mm. No, go back to one. I'm sorry, just a second. He looks very young to yes. be helping. How uh, about what's his age range? He's actually he's a teenager, which in Syria is almost like an adult. People uh, 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 in Syria take responsibility for the family very early. The mm. kids bring up the other kids. Mm. It's and that's a fact all over Asia. You will see very uh, toddlers uh, helping cook. So uh, here are teenagers with their uh, shoe polishing uh, things. Uh, many of them are actually gypsies, which was even in a tougher space. The gypsies that had to flood Syria, uh, the Rumis, um, different words for it. We call them Ghajar. Uh, uh, many of them wouldn't even be received together with the Syrians because like a lot of the world, there's a lot of prejudice against them, the Rumi people. Here you see men um, either uh, doing makeshift selling or whatever selling, yeah, like they sell bread, Making they sell cake, they or they're just waiting uh, we, to be uh, day laborers. Yeah, we, we, Syrians are known for being yeah. good agrarians, but also very good construction workers. Mm, yeah, well, we we call it on the hustle. You know, you got you to do your hustle. You got to grind. You know, so that's okay. Or some of them don't find nothing the little older ones these are in their 50s though they look like they're in their 60s and uh, this is a prison actually that wasn't occupied and was open to house syrian families so every cell with the chain still on the ground housed uh, a syrian family these are the professionals um, that actually we started working with, but you see them here eating and just being in their homes because that's a reality. It's not just the poor and uh, the uh, illiterate or semi-literate that flood. Everybody looks the same, but when you start, when they're refugees, because the means are low, but actually uh, there's a lot of capabilities in the midst. This, uh, we also looked where they're dwelling, and this is actually more details about the abandoned uh, prison in Sweri in the Bekaa Valley. And this is the school. This is by the rivers of the Litani. So we organized ourselves once we were introduced, Metwali and myself, and later Tuya. And we developed a curriculum and formed a collection of Lebanese, Syrians, Syrian Lebanese, some of uh, Kati, who uh, was a manager of People's Media Center working in DC. She's Finnish. She mm -hmm. came from Finland to help. My cousins Which helped one, their friends. That's Kati. Mm -hmm. That's Leia from New York. My cousins, people we met. She's an architect, she's a teacher. Musicians, Lebanese musician, Lebanese Palest uh, Palestinian, and um, these are photos of us in various workshops or uh, there. Now, when you say uh, uh, set the curriculum, or, or develop the curriculum, what do, is a, well? What kind of curriculum is is it? Is, it, it is the curriculum much different than when people think of curriculum? You know, like mathematics or whatever it is. What, what it, Where we identified with the Syrian. Pre, um, uh, psychologist, uh, trauma recovery expert, youth counselors, I'm a youth counselor myself, certified, artists, video videographers, and others, many of the Syrians being refugees themselves, that people needed workshops in psychosocial recovery. Mm -hmm. And so the curriculum was, how do we do interventions? First, to go into the community, because you don't want a parachute in it. Mm -hmm. You want what we call keys, ways to open the community to be receptive of us. Mm -hmm. Second, we needed different circles for the kids. We would organize them in different age groups. Mm -hmm. And for the um, women, we had different also, depending on the age, the teenagers will need something different than the young mothers, than the elders, and the men uh, needed a different thing. It'll come. So, um, so basically, it's a developing uh, curriculum. It's a developing okay. or curriculum. Or continuously developing curriculum. I yes, okay. yes, on the go. But also um, a curriculum to how we're going to provide executive support mm -hmm. also for both Lebanese, Syrian, and Palestinian, Syrian, Palestinian, Lebanese groups mm -hmm. that are formed to help. 
so they're young some of them have experience running program others don't but it was important to enable the community to run their own projects versus being there while a lot of europeans not many from the u.s came um, to help run programs there mm. for the millions of refugees. As a matter of fact, Lebanon received some four million refugees or Ooh. three and a half million refugees. Yeah, yeah. For a country that's no bigger than, oh my goodness. Than San Francisco. <laughs> so um, in solidarity, we can support Farid Beirut to work on uh, helping the Syrian cope with trauma, teach critical thinking and civic responsibility practice dialogue and social cohesion. Some of these ideas came from my experience, as I said, interviewing for years Haitians and Latin Americans about what they needed in their communities. And we discussed that with the women first to see what they need. When we talked with the women, they said what they need was also education because their children are monolinguistic while Lebanon is bilingual, French uh, Arabic or uh, uh, English Arabic that they were ashamed of their clothing, so they needed uniforms and backpacks so that they would kind of be the same as the others. Mm -hmm. So we built a fleet of trained educators and social workers to end empowering girls and women. We did a few case studies. So sometimes I am showing you a slide that talks about what we did, but then I go back to how we came about to it. So Thank You Lebanon campaign was actually spearheaded by Warid, which means wild roses, or roses. And it's created by a young man who thought that what he needs is to nurture young people so that his program of psychosocial support um, grows like wild roses. And that's why the name. And they created, uh, because there's a lot of tension, right, between the Lebanese and the Syrians. And that's because, yes, it was a huge flood and the resources aren't great. You got to understand that Lebanon is so small that half the community lives abroad for the most part since centuries. And um, those left behind are often those that couldn't travel away. So bread and uh, salt is an expression. Let's break bread and salt. We're one family. And uh, the concept of it was to ease the effect of having more than a million and a half, sorry, Syrians coming to Lebanon as refugees. I'm sorry, I made a mistake in my numbers. It was a million and a half. Altogether, Lebanon ended up being four and a half million people living there. Syrians and Lebanese are one family. Um, we trained the uh, people before they hit the street because they could have, they needed to ease any tension that rises from them being in the street, even though they're giving help to the Lebanese and distributing things for Ramadan. We distributed food food and sweets. Okay, and when you say train, what does that mean? Uh, just give me a short thumbnail, what do you mean by, by train? What, what adjustments would have... I mean, it's very important to learn how to uh, de-escalate te uh, tension, mm -hmm. how to de-escalate people approaching them to talk with them, how to approach oh, the it, community it, 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 to offer. If the offer. person's aggressive, then you have to de-escalate that aggression, you're saying. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. And also, what, even though you're giving, in the beginning, they don't, as soon as they see you as Syrians, they will think you're, go you're there to ask them for something. Mm -hmm. So how to come into communities that were not that welcoming to Syrians and offer the various things they were offering mm -hmm. to say thank you Lebanon and we also debriefed with them um, afterwards so as to build on acquired knowledge in the field so here you see a debriefing cycle but we also dealt with the media because mm -hmm. we attracted on purpose the media and we wanted to use and speak to the media as to the issue of how we're one family and this was a, a campaign to help the Lebanese especially disenfranchised communities um, this is preparing the food and also hosting a huge breaking of fast Ramadan. So 27 volunteers gathered to feed fasting people, part of the bread and salt campaign led by Warid, and play with the children and do um, now, some... A word, is that an acronym? Was, was the, Warid, uh, it means what? roses. Oh, the W-A-R-D. 
means roses in, in um, Arabic. Ar Arabic. Oh, what it, okay. Yeah. And we created t-shirts. Actually, some of our team members were our graphic designers, so they created the logo for Warid as our gift mm -hmm. to Warid and also um, for the campaign, Bread and Salt. So you see them with the t-shirt up front saying Bread and Salt and in the back saying Warid. We also went to the south and built coalition. Here you see part of the team. I made sure that Farid Beirut includes people from all background, mm -hmm. um, religiously and politically. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a problem because we're focused on the work mm -hmm. and the Lebanese that worked with us were also from very various background. Mm -hmm. Some uh, different cities, different economic strata, different education levels. We worked with Al Amal Institute for Disabled People, an organization that's been doing that in Lebanon for more than 50 years. And this was uh, helping them setting up a, a festival. And it's uh, in a village called the Rock Village in South Lebanon. We brought again our um, photographers everywhere. And here you see me with the leader of Al Amal Institute. An interesting story there. His name, uh, his nickname is Abu Wahid, and his name, uh, his last name is Sulh. A lot, I would attribute a lot of my way of thinking, my um, my community work, my ideology, my values, besides my bringing up with my parents, coming from when I went to college and I participated in a co-op that um, was. Um, selling the stationeries and doing the photocopies and whatever and was part of the photo um, was the hub of the photography club at the American University of Beirut where I did my undergrad mm -hmm. unbeknown to me years later when I come back and I'm running Farid Beirut and we're working I get introduced to Al Amal Institute for the Disabled and Abu Wahid was the founder of the co-op mm -hmm. that formed me mm -hmm. So it was especially important and precious for me to work with his organization. They still continue. So 18 of us went down to help in Arnoon, South Lebanon, run that festival. We um, also did a lot of uh, psychosocial support workshops for the young women and men in his organization who are adults with special needs, but also they were hosting orphan visit and kids from another organization of uh, disenfranchised people. So the Syrians were running all the workshops and from psychodrama to teenage, you will see them. Um, you will see physical therapy because actually trauma stiffens your body. So it's very important. And we use that help and intervention to actually test out our uh, workshops so that we can implement them in other places. There were rivers, so we took them swimming, we played football, teamwork, uh, we invented games to engage the toddlers, the uh, young adolescents, the adolescents and the olders. We uh, did a lot of art therapy. Of course, in the midst of every community are artists, so they led these programs. Here you can see some of the young men in special needs dancing on the table. He insisted on starting to take off his clothes because it was hot. We stopped him at the shorts. That's why you see him in a T-shirt and a short. And we painted. We dance. This is a very important photo. There is more than seven Lebanese communities here that would have never talked with each other if it wasn't of our program. Mm -hmm. Because remember again, Lebanon just came out of a civil war after the Taif agreement where it stopped suddenly. But when it comes to working with people in special needs, it breaks the ice and everybody is here. Here you see a young woman dancing. We're cheering and on. We worked with people with special needs and Amal Institute again more and also ate together. Eating is very important mm -hmm. in Arabic programs mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, again, breaking bread and salt together. And like Andy Shalal, who created um, uh, uh, 
busboys and poets of various cafes in Washington, Mm D.C., where activists gather and think and talk, but also he sells food and drinks. I said, why food? He said, because every community is trained to have some manners around a table. Mm. So they'll be at their best behavior. Yeah, the code, yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, he said, when um, the food goes in the stomach, the blood rushes there, so it leaves the brain open for new ideas. (laughs) So I love that, and we implemented it by helping cook a meal. Um, That's another program that we did with Al-Amal Institute, where uh, we helped them uh, with Tathmir, another nonprofit organization that I formed with Lebanese when I was there. We got a huge donation of uh, trees to plant and from the uh, Ministry of Agriculture. And we uh, brought some 100 Syrians to actually help plant uh, 1,200 trees that were donation. And um, the concept of the Rock Village is very important by Al-Amal Institute. Al-Amal Institute doesn't just host young men and women of special needs. It also trains them in uh, crafts, in art. And this is a new project where they wanted to uh, build the Rock Village and um, grow, have them grow the grains and various things and then gather them in uh, bags of food that now they give to disenfranchised uh, families all over Lebanon, but also to the refugees. Mm -hmm. So people and organization donate to Al-Amal Institute. Al-Amal Institute uh, young men and women work to actually um, put that in portions, Mm -hmm. and then we help distribute it, but other organizations did that. So here we are planting trees, even the little ones, we organize them as the stampeding Uh, little elephant's army Mm -hmm. because after you put the tree in the soil they would Mm -hmm. stampede to pack the Mm -hmm. earth which Mm -hmm. is a way to make sure the tree is healthy and they will water it it was a hell of an outing for them many hadn't left um, in months and months the refugee camp or the um, school or whatever where they were we uh Uh, here are helping them um, in another, yet another uh, time, do the project. We also have a band with us that we brought to Brumana, which is their center, to help host uh, uh, community gathering. Now, it's important to note that in South Lebanon, it's mostly Shiite Muslim communities. In Brumana, it's Christian right-wing communities. So by bringing the Syrians to these various places, working with Al-Amal Institute, we're exposing various communities of Lebanese to the capabilities of the Syrian. We're helping out, we're doing community intervention programs to ease the tension. Um, And we are using the donations, though we decided in Farid Beirut we're not gonna be a humanitarian aid organization or team, but we would use these donations of Al-Amal Institute as keys to open communities or go in places that don't know us. So here you see us distributing that and carrying nutritional campaign. This is Dr. Uh, Abdel Rahim, who actually is a young Syrian a dentist, but also studied nutrition. He, some Lebanese also would bring their children to become interns with us. So here is Tala, who came from Europe to work with us for a whole summer. And uh, Dia's family all together, here is her husband, her children, everybody helped. The second case study was supporting the Lebanese young people that opened the school in Hart Nami. I met uh, Mahir, who was driving the van as we are going to the prison that I had showed you before in Sfer, to look at how the Syrians are living, and we were uh, animating uh, activities that day as Syrian for Syrians. He said, well, if you want to help Syrians, we opened, we busted open a school to house that. And I'm like, how did that come about? He's like, well, we are young Lebanese um, uh, fathers with young children 
the age of the children running in the streets with the Syrian families, and it couldn't, we couldn't bear to see people like us just in the street. There was this abandoned school in our neighborhood, which is Hartanami, neither Beirut nor Saida, which um, are big cities and are getting a lot of help. And uh, we negotiated it with all the various factions of the neighborhood, and they told us, we won't help you open it, but once you open it, we'll help you, um, you know, uh, be safe there, but you're responsible. So they did it, and it was housing 266 refugees, 53 families, and it was 17 young men from Lebanon that opened it. It's an abandoned school. Um, this is part of the team. Sorry, the um, uh, sorry. One second. The so what? So here is our second intervention case study. It's in details, but it's important because very few had done so much learning about what's going on as they're doing programs. They will get some funding from Europe or something. We funded Fariq Beirut, by the way, from my money, that of my family. My brother had his 50th uh, birthday in Belgium. Him and his wife told everybody, instead of gifts, just mm -hmm. donate. Um, some women stepped in, gave us $10,000, mm -hmm. saying, when we started our organization, we each put in 10000 see what you could do with it. So things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Even at funerals, I would fundraise. Mm -hmm. So here is how we build capacity. We uh, discussed what we had f thought would be relevant workshops and uh, programs, so what I call the curriculum, and we discussed it. That's my brother with mostly the women, but also the men were around. We discussed it with some of the young men running the Hart Name school, and we agreed on how we're going to do things. So we documented it for all to see. The priority <laughs> was housing, trauma, and kids out of school, according to them. So we got some funding to convert these tents into little shacks. And you can still see the kids. That's the beginning of the intervention. And um, here is a gathering in the hall, actually in the yard of the school of the refugees. This is uh, the shacks. Maybe for many eyes, it's like, what the hell? You so did that? This was better than the tents and better yeah. insulated. So here we're building. The, we tallied the children. And there was 106 among 266 people, some with special needs. We brought in the band with Ashraf Sholi on Oud, with Ziad Faran and Jamal on percussion, and uh, to the school. And these are Lebanese and Lebanese Palestinians trained in actually psychosocial support. And the kids were the fronts. The man barely interfered. He's the only one who eventually started dancing. The teenagers were just very cool, like every teenager's watching. And he is Maher, who ended up working very closely with us in uh, Fariq Beirut and Tal'in al um, We did an, uh, a talent show for young girls and young boys, and it brought a lot of joy, but opened. We re uh, this decided with the young people of Fariq Beirut about what is needed. We did some more evaluation and formed a team to start doing regular interventions. We took them to um, an event held in Beirut by another organization um, to, to also have this other organization practitioner evaluate the needs so we're not just relying on our own selves and mixing them with other Syrians that have had some interventions before to see. And here they painted, be happy, sing, and play with us, rising onto the light. Um, we initially had called the intervention team 
we rose into the light and then we changed it into rising into the light. So these are some of the events. There's always art and drawing. Then every three months we would debrief with the community. We will do a big women's circle. First, the teenage girls will speak and leave the room. Then the young mothers will tell us what they think worked, what we need to do and leave the room. And then the elder women. So here you see the circle. And that's when they really insisted we should have some English uh, classes. So we s decorated and set up, and we helped with the uniforms. Can we go, let me go back to that process where the women, you know, first the uh, young women and then the mothers, the young mothers and then the older women. Uh, that's a, that's a, uh, I like that technique. Uh, how did you come up with that? How did that where did that come from? Um, my own experience, my own background. Um, watching in the village as I was growing up, uh, my dad will take me with him to the village and I will see the women sitting as they're preparing the meal and I would end up often helping them with the meal as we're visiting and he is supervising the sharecroppers and what happened and what have you on his various lands. I would see them make discussing a lot of serious things around the cooking of the meal mm -hmm. as a community. Mm -hmm. So it kind of came almost natural um, that that's what needs to happen. We asked them if this made sense and they said yes. They responded very well. Every direction they gave us from the first couple of circles were right on spot. Mm -hmm. And our programs as Farid Beirut were ahead of a lot of other programs in Lebanon of organizations. So we realize we're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And, and remember, Dia is with us. This is a psychodrama to sort out tension among the teenagers and mm -hmm. the teenagers and their mothers. Of course, the mothers will be present, even though we are working with the teenagers. Later, as we gained the confidence and the uh, of the community, they allowed us to have workshops with the teens just by ourselves. Mm -hmm. So here they're working out a rift between them, and they resolved it through psychodrama but after expressing it physically. Um, and here is, we would hold, we eventually, from the 10,000 donation actually, we rented a center which was a home in Shatila, which is another refugee camp in Beirut. And it allowed the upper floor to house our leaders because, you know, five of them were living in one room. How long can you do that? And yet de de develop programs. So we did that, but we had a lot of uh, bedding, mattresses, like mm -hmm. we do in the village in Syria, on top of each other. And at night, the whole place becomes a sleeping place. We had the kitchen. And we would do two, three days of training. Everybody will sleep there, because sometimes they were still fighting and shelling. It was very interesting. When we actually were deciding where we're going to rent this center, when we found that house, it seemed like it was raining, though the sky was blue. And I looked above and I saw a pipe with water dripping from it. And I asked the people there, what's going on? They're like, oh, don't worry about it. There was a, a baccalaureate graduation yesterday. They'll mend the pipes. Hmm. Now for you, you'll be like, what does this have to do with a leaking uh, pipe? Unfortunately, uh, we still have this Mediterranean habit of shooting up in the air when we're happy mm -hmm. in weddings and in graduation <laughs> okay. and yeah. when people oh, bring. Right, right. Okay. So basically the day before there was a lot of bullets flying around and I'm thinking, am I out of my mind? And then my other brain is like, Reem, you grew up surrounded by bullets flying in the air and war and all. It's a good house. It's a good place. The living room was very big. It had the kitchen so we could train. So here you see them in the living room. Mm -hmm. Here we're preparing the meal. The, it wasn't just Metwali, me and Dia. Every one of the young people participated. So he's 19. Um, you know, he was um, our administrative assistant, Khaldun, he's great. This is uh, Abdel Salam. Now each one of these is in a different country and some stayed in Lebanon. Still doing the work? Doing the work or just trying to survive by going to university, mm -hmm. by rebuilding their lives. But uh, on the side, many are doing. Here we had brought them a philosophy teacher to talk of ethics. Because it's not enough to hone the technical skills mm -hmm. of the practitioners. It was a very important 
to have them be on the same page with respect to common human values, to ethics, to vocalize them so that we are standardizing the approach of the work. Because when you do psychosocial support, yes, you're following a workshop, but at the end of the day, a lot of issues resolution you're doing as a practitioner right there and there. It's not enough to bring your, of course, we would screen who's working with us, mm. But it's important to also bring them, but also include in the curriculum mm. philosophy and uh, ethics um, and civil responsibility. Um, A little logic wouldn't, wouldn't hurt either. <laughs> they had the logic. Mm. But um, to vocalize critical thinking so that you can train the refugees in critical thinking is very important. Um, to also work not as a charity but as a solidarity, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and to work sustainably sus and in a sustainable way. What I mean with these words is if you have a printer, you sustain it but always make sure mm -hmm. that you have papers for it, right, mm -hmm. as an organization. Mm -hmm. But you also need to use the both sides of the paper so that your project is sustainable. So we would bring all these thoughts as practices as we're training our team, but also other teams. Also, the center became often the, uh, like we uh, did an engagement party there. We did a wedding there. We did a graduation celebration because many of the Syrians were sleeping in every single room of any dwelling they were in. Mm -hmm. So are Palestinians. So not many had a community room. So it doubled as that. And um, then we started working, um, uh, uh, offering some of our things for practitioners in psychosocial support um, program. Here we are with Amil, which means worker, which is an amazing organization in Lebanon that I had evaluated. Um, I also evaluated, as we're evaluating what Syrian needs, I evaluated the Lebanese organizations and see whose values are aligned with my value. Those of self-determination, of empowerment. Again, working in solidarity, not charity, and of course, Amil comes ahead of all of that. So these are workshops in Amil with other organizations. We also brought experts. Here is Leila Latshan. She's an amazing psychologist that works all over the world with refugees. She's Palestinian, actually, from Palestine. She lives there. So when she came to Lebanon, um, paid by a big organization to evaluate the need of the refugees, she helped us with some of the workshops. So the training and the program of Fari Beirut is so much bigger than us because of our dynamic, as you said, curriculum being developed on the go mm -hmm. and the ability of having captive audience. Mm -hmm. Not that they're locked down, but they're in this dwelling of a school. So it's a controlled environment. And we debriefed the beneficiary about the program so they help guide it. And um, we also doubled with the Association of International uh, Human Values, which here is teaching us Sudrashan Kriya, and we would implement it as a release in all of our workshops. And um, we... <coughs> oh, uh, we also started bringing our team to talk in uh, conventions, which um, Lebanon was full of, um, and to weigh in on evaluation. We um, worked on a methodology that I learned <coughs> from the Urban Justice Center in New York mm -hmm. of um, having organization represent their programs and their theory graphically. Mm -hmm. So um, we did that with local graphic designers. And um, here we were. We also worked with international organization doing further research about, for instance, one research which we published was what are Syrians doing inside Syria for peace, and uh, what do Syrians need? Why uh, we love you, but so we wrote articles. Both Metwali and I are journalists, by the way. I forgot to say that about Metwali. So. We were very similar of having worn many hats in our life. It came 
to bear on here. So here you see our team in various events and conventions and more Lebanese started coming and bringing their Eastern training to us. Um, this is Dia, a young woman who was presenting for the first time of her life on a national, um, actually it was an international gathering. She was presenting our methodology and mm -hmm. curriculum. And you see that our workshops became more sophisticated. We started getting uh, m more tools to work with them. And eventually, this is a groundbreaking thing. The men who had refused to gather and circle and do workshops mm -hmm. saw the effect that it had on their wives and they liked it and on their children. So they asked that we do a program for them. Mm -hmm. Mutwali had been working with them one-on-one, -on -one, but n n not really together. At the same time, the mothers and the kids were insisting that they'd love to go to the beach, but I couldn't take responsibility of taking 166 kids to the beach. Mm. So by doing a program for the fathers on the beach, everybody came. Mm. And this way, we were able to host both. So this was the first man's circle that we ever did. Mm. And that's where Shirin, who's a psychologist, came. She was doing her research on um, the effect of trauma on the Syrians. And we had two kids that were really hard to work with. They disturbed every workshop. They were brothers. So I had her interview them, but uh, the father wouldn't allow them to be interviewed if he didn't get interviewed first. He wanted to know that nobody is controlling their mind. So she was on the side doing that research mm -hmm. that ended up being a paper and she ended up working with us. It was a formal evaluation and it helped a lot the young people just to be heard. Um, we needed to debrief the uh, c uh, rising into the light team, the young people, because yes, they're working, we have a curriculum, we're training them, but they themselves are refugees, themselves are hearing that. <coughs> And I used with them what I used to do with Modern Dance Company by taking them to an exhibition of Syrian art. We talked about art. So the briefing of their emotions happened when we were talking about the other Syrians. Mm. So it's a methodology that I picked up by working with kids at risk in New York, Los Angeles, and Washington. It worked nicely with them. Um, we uh, realized that we need to be much more direct. This open house wasn't enough to just build a social capital for these Syrians that have been pulled away from their community. A lot of people that haven't lived wars and displacement don't realize that a major, major issue of being a refugee is that you leave your community behind. And mm. so you leave a lot of, actually, people that know that are people who live in neighborhood that have other communities and richer people be parachuted in it. So rebuilding the social capital, we decided to open an arts club. And this was the case study three, which is a workshop kitchen, a youth and children's summer club. And the graphic of the flyer was done by Karina, who's a Lebanese. We also worked with Dikostamin, mm -hmm. which is a very, very big Syrian gathering that became an organization that we had met along the way. Oh, I'm sorry, what do you mean by Syrian gathering? Is it an annual thing? What no, no, no. A gather, gathered organization. Like, Farid Beirut is 46 experts, mm -hmm. and we had between 12 to 17 practitioners and volunteers. Mm -hmm. Um, the Costamine has hundreds of members all over the country. Mm. So it's a much bigger, and it's not an organization as in a non-profit. It's a community-based organization, mm. basically. So we work together on creating Farid Beirut with Artscape. And we opened it in Al Makhoul. Al Makhoul Street is a street in Lebanon that's known for its like parallel to um, the street in front of the American University of Beirut. Mm. It had always hosted art uh, festivals and uh, galleries and things like that. So we opened uh, our program within Artscape, which was a project done by Tare, a young Lebanese from the South who had come to the United States, gone back and opened that mm. center. Again, aligned values. 
Um, so here was the opening. And every week on a Saturday, we had a whole day of event. It was a workshop for us to test our, um, it was a kitchen workshop, but also a space to release, a space where Lebanese and Syrians could share their capabilities, their questioning, and whatever. So we worked it together. And we would take the workshops. It also, Tare brought to us the awareness that it's very important to work on urban gardening so that people start reusing their capabilities in planting to feed themselves. So we had an intervention in the neighborhood, helping plant in the neighborhood. We had chess, um, another event at uh, Al Amal Institute. Um, it was here I'm featuring the fact that all of our programs had people with special needs and kids of special needs. And this is Omar, who um, was very proudly sharing his capabilities to write. Because growing up in Lebanon in the war, I saw a lot of people with special needs as a outcome of the war that were hidden in people's homes. Mm -hmm. And whether they would hit by missiles and explosions or bullets and maimed physically or whether they were born with a lot of uh, a lot of challenges because either they were exposed to the gas that was we were bombed with or um, their parents were very scared when they conceived them or during pregnancy it was very important for our programs to include people with special needs so the practitioners when they go back to Syria or wherever they're working are comfortable working with kids with special needs. So uh, this illustrates some of it. We would circle at the end of every day. There was always a debriefing, but people who participated, people who gave it, and the p kids with special needs will be the first to be in the center. Mm -hmm. And whether they shared a word or even gestured what they thought was good or what was the problem, mm -hmm. it was very important for them to give their peace. Give an expression. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So Farid Beirut basically synthesized itself as offering community-led, scientifically-based psychosocial training and interventions. We worked on integrating psychosocial support and popular and peace education, heritage revival, cultural support and psychodrama, support building for women, teen, and rape survivors programs, and providing music and art therapy, talking circles, one-on-one -on -one sessions for trauma release, stress management and team building, and opening dialogue with hosts and community training. And that's where all my work in radio and in youth counseling and in um, um, working with kids at risk came in handy. I am actually professionally trained as a youth counselor from a program called Active Methods of Education, which is in France, Belgium, and Lebanon. And it is actually now helping uh, shape the uh, European Union uh, methodology of youth programs. Uh, we continuously uh, had part of our method of work documentation, so more and more learned how to use the cameras. Our teenagers were trained in documenting and um, the lessons learned and sharing um, that would always happen with other organizations. Um, new leadership was developed. One of the shortcoming of a lot of Arab organizations is you have amazing leaders that keep aging and the young people are just working for them. We gave the leadership to a lot. We absorbed any, she's um, Latin American and she was part of the people who trained us in Sudrasha and Kriya, which is the yoga of breath. And uh, this is another campaign led by actually a Syrian business um, called uh, Swell. Swell mm -hmm. is just the wave before it raises and mm -hmm. crashes. Mm -hmm. And um, that young woman, actually from my hometown, created it, which is for Valentine's Day, give a plant to Lebanese. So it was another public intervention. We fixed a lot of places because we had the capabilities of doing so. We increased research and did focus group and worked with Swiss Peace on the research program. So this is the debriefing of it. 
These are two of our amazing teenage. Now, she went to college uh, recently in Turkey for uh, learning special education, and he graduated um, from an institute where he learned how to do computer and graphic design. So it's amazing things. I actually got a phone call uh, three days ago about them uh, in Turkey. I'm in touch with the mom who opened a special needs center in Turkey. We often celebrated what happened. And in solidarity, we can build a pedagogic roadmap for a new society of fulfilled individuals thriving joyfully in harmony with neighbors and nature. These are our values. We mm. put them in a big sentence. Mm. It can get better. Look at now these photos of similar kids mm. that had the trauma vision. This is after only three months of intervention. Mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. So definitely we can help any community cope, study, be empowered for a better tomorrow. We can't ignore the urgent crisis. This is what happened in Lebanon um, by December. Uh, there was a rape that happened, and the Lebanese came in and burned 400, uh, a settlement that was housing 400 people. And this was the reaction of the Lebanese army to the men of that encampment. Things are still happening. But look at, we can really make a difference. If we learn how to do that, and every community should do it, and we want to bring back lessons learned to United States and Europe. We are now working on a couple of programs. We're supporting a youth center led um, by youth in South Lebanon in um, the northern camp in Tir or Sur, as we say in Arabic. We provided them with a computer lab and a library. They even have stitching and different programs. And I even ask these youth people, it's like, why would you teach women how to stitch? I mean, Syrians know how to stitch, Lebanese know how to stitch. They're like, with being refugees, they didn't have a chance to be exposed to their elders. So a lot mm -hmm. of the survival skills of a household didn't get taught. So they're reteaching uh, traditional um, um, cooking and um, these basic things. And so on, yeah. And Dia went in Turkey with her family as refugees, but that's where she opened a special needs center um, and uh, for speech rehabilitation. And they're doing amazing programs for the last five years. And this is where we're at as goals after 2020. We want to de uh, develop best practices and share them. We want to uh, share expertise, as I said. We want to keep supporting the youth center, the Yaruna and Ria center. And we want to ground ourselves as a sustained organization. So what we're concentrating on is that I'm setting up a business to fund us and our programs, um, hoping that in five years, um, through my work with Primerica Financial Services, I can ho uh, have a business of half a million mm. to allow anybody who's interested in part-time extra income opportunity, which the company has done for 44 years. We're training practitioner in thinking in images, which is a transformational coaching by Alberto Botero, and later we intend to continue working with Naomi Payman, Paymal with her Pedagogia 3000, which is an amazing eight petal education program. And we're working on building a circle of allies supporting Farid Beirut work in Lebanon, Turkey, and the USA, mm. and now Canada. I actually just came back from Canada where we're trying to expand. This is the team, and the question is, what can everybody do to support us so we can support the world? Mm. Well, thank you for this, Reem. I, uh, I'm going to, of course, put through my YouTube channel. The URL will be available to you so you can show it to anybody, whatever it is. But I'm going to title this, uh, Not Charity, Solidarity. Right, that's, what I, that's what I get out of this, this presentation. Thank you so much for this. Exactly.